Well, it looks like it's time to get started. We'll just uh, go ahead here and start with the announcements. Uh, a few announcements that I want to bring your attention to, uh, some of which are in the bulletin that Clay sent out, is uh, that uh, Richard Cook is continuing to uh, uh, recover in the nursing home. Uh, also, uh, this one I don't think was in there in the bulletin, uh, William Thorpe is in Bourbon County Hospital recovering from breathing problems. Uh, also, Russ and Kathy Rogers uh, have been diagnosed with COVID. Uh, they're doing okay. Uh, they're at home and recovering well from it, at least at last uh, call. So, uh, also, uh, my son, Miles Anderson, has been diagnosed with COVID, but he's uh, got very minor symptoms. He's not having any problems at all, really. So we're thankful for all those cases. Uh, we, of course, are doing virtual today, uh, an assessment of the parking lot there at the church uh, made it clear that it would remain slippery, even though we'd cleared it of snow and everything. Uh, the remelt and other conditions made us concerned that it would cause some harm to someone. And so we're doing virtual this Sunday. Uh, hopefully, uh, we will uh, be live at the at the uh, church building next Sunday. At least that's what we pray for. Are there uh, any announcements that I may have missed this morning? Okay. Uh, if not, I'm going to turn it over to Henry. He's going to lead us in song. Okay. I'll be giving you. Uh... Two different page numbers. The uh, first page number is page 19 in the new book and 162 in the old book. I don't have either. <laughs> page 19 in the new book, page 162 in the old book. And we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Uh, the name of the song is All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown them Lord of all. Ye chosen seeds of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown them Lord of all, hail him who saves you by his grace and crown them, Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throne we as his feet may We'll join the everlasting song and crown them Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown them Lord of all. Our next selection is This World Is Not My Home. In the new book, it's 684. The old book, it's 957. 684 and 957. 
We'll be singing verses one and two. <laughs> This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are stored up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. The next song is Where Could I Go? It's page 745 in the new book. 745. It is not in the old book. And we'll sing verses 1 and 2. Where could I go? <laughs> Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving along to face temptation sore. Where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Meaning a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Neighbors are kind. I love them, everyone. We get along in sweet accord. But when my soul needs manna from above, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul, needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Our next selection is Sweet Hour of Prayer. In the new book, it's 618, the old book at 827, 618 and 827. And we'll be singing verses one and two. And after this uh, selection, we'll be having the prayer and the lesson. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my 
my father's throne, make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief. And all snakes gave the tempered snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, the joy I feel, the bliss I share. Of those whose anxious spirits burn with strong desires for thy return. With such a hasten to the place where God my Savior shows his face. And gladly take my station there and wait for the sweet hour of prayer. There you go. Reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, it's the first chapter. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too, too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Set word of prayer. Lord our God, we're thankful for the opportunity you've given us this morning to gather in your name and study a portion of your word. We pray, Lord, that even though we're not together, we can be united in heart and spirit, and we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And you'll be with us this hour, and we pray that this worship will be pleasing unto you. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to join with you through this uh, virtual method this morning. Thankful for the opportunity that we have to meet in this way, even though it's not the same as being together. I was thinking this week about all the ways that coronavirus has changed our lives. And in this case, the change is actually a good one because in times past, if we had not been able to meet because of weather, we would have been, been for ourselves at home. But uh, today we're able to meet together virtually in this way and so at least one good thing uh, we can take from the coronavirus pandemic and the way that it has changed our lives uh, this year we are remembering from psalm 77 so we're going to quote psalm 77 11 which says i will remember the deeds of the lord yes i will remember your wonders of old when I began my college career at Reed Hardeman University, I was enrolled in a number of general education courses, and one of those was a physical science class. 
and that class was populated by freshmen and sophomores who weren't quite sure where they were headed and who were frankly wondering what this class had to do with their eventual major courses of study. It was taught by a sort of quirky professor. He was very hands-on and he assigned homework every week. And I had a classmate who sat beside me and he was the epitome of disorganization. He would rush into class late every time, disheveled, his workbook in hand, and he would ask me frantically, well, which worksheet is due today? And then would come the inevitably awkward question. Hey, do you mind if I look over yours while I finish mine? I have to say that that was more awkward and more challenging for me than it should have been. But anytime we have moral convictions, those convictions will be tested. The people that we're going to consider today from Exodus chapter 1, Shifra and Pua, also faced a moral dilemma. And I'm grateful to say that they showed more courage and fortitude than I did in PHS 111. If you haven't opened your Bibles, I ask you to do so now to Exodus chapter 1. And in just a few moments, we're going to read from verses 15 through 22. But before we do that, I want to think about how we got to this place. As the book of Genesis closes, we learn about Joseph's death in Egypt. But we have to back up even before that and understand how Joseph and his family arrived in Egypt. The providence of God was at work so that the family of Jacob came to the land of Goshen, a region in Egypt, and dwelt there. This happened through the way that God directed the events of the close of the book of Genesis. Joseph lands in Egypt, and he has this divine gift that, of a dream interpretation. And he interprets the dreams of Pharaoh about this coming uh, problem in the land, this uh, lack of food that was going to, to plague the whole uh, nation and several nations, in fact. And because of Joseph's divine gift, as well as his shrewd stewardship, he rose to a place of prominence in Egypt, made second in command, and he saved the people. And his whole family comes to dwell in the land of Egypt, and he is celebrated. But as the book of Exodus opens, and as Adam read for us a few moments ago, a new Pharaoh arises in Egypt who does not know Joseph or his family. We may wonder how that could happen. How could it be that someone who was so important in the national history of Egypt could be so easily forgotten? And commentators have speculated about changes in dynasty and various people that ruled over Egypt. And the fact is, the text doesn't tell us. But because he is forgotten, this new Pharaoh is afraid of the Israelites, and he places a difficult burden on them. And when he sees that the oppression and the burdens that he has placed on the children of Israel do not slow them down and do not diminish them, he turns to an even more sinister plot, and that plot is recorded in Exodus chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. So let's read that text together. The Bible says, Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. I want to notice three things from this text this morning. And the first one is Pharaoh's wicked request. 
Pharaoh's request is based upon fear. We noted last week in our study of Genesis 38, of Judah and Tamar, that Judah was led by fear, and his fear mm -hmm. caused him to do things that were immoral. Here we have a very similar situation in which Pharaoh's unfounded fear of the Israelites leads him to make these wicked and immoral plans. The Pharaoh's plan involved killing the male children because he viewed these as the greater potential threat. The line of thinking would have gone that these males would be able to grow up and be strong and able-bodied and could fashion weapons and use them against the Egyptians. And in fact, when we look at the history of Egypt, we see that another Semitic group known as the Hyksos had actually uh, conquered a portion of Egypt and led that uh, a portion of the land of Egypt, perhaps before Joseph came to Egypt. And so this was not an entirely unfounded expectation or fear, but certainly was not based upon what we know about the family of Joseph. Think for a moment about Joseph, about the Pharaoh's plan. What would it have really involved for the midwives to kill the male children? They would have to come into the homes of the Hebrews, and they would have to deliver the babies. This is the only way that they would know if the baby was male or female. And then they would have to take that child, that living being, into their arms and in some way take its life by suffocating it or breaking its neck or some other method, all while not being detected by the rest of the people in the room. Otherwise, the Hebrews would cease calling mm. upon the midwives for assistance. The only you know, kids they can have, they can midwives are taking the, water. The midwives are in a very uh, difficult position. The girl. Because on the one hand, <laughs> they fear God, uh, and they value yeah, life. And they and their job is to preserve life. I mean, I mean, they can have. But on the other hand, they have this very powerful, perhaps the most powerful man in the world, telling them to do this. And the Pharaoh is able, probably, to do anything he wants to to the midwives without impunity. And so they're faced with a dilemma to either do what they know is right and risk their own lives or to comply with the Pharaoh's request and be safe from his wrath. There is an oriental legend that tells of a traveler in the desert who met two strangers, fear and plague, who were on their way to a great city where they planned to kill some 10,000 people. The traveler asked Plague, will you do all of the killing? And Plague responded, oh no, I'll only kill a few hundred. My friend Fear will do the rest. The Bible warns us of the danger of fear. Proverbs 29, 25 says that the fear of man lays a snare but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Shifra and Pua had a decision to make, but Pharaoh's decision was based upon human fear. How might the enemy be using fear in your life? How might Satan be using fear to weaken your faith? When we make our decisions, are we motivated by fear? Satan might use fear to cause us to omit what God has commanded us to do or to rebel against what God has prohibited us to do. Fear as a primary motivator, at least the kind of fear that Pharaoh displays on this occasion, leads to immorality. So we first of all see Pharaoh's wicked request. Second of all, we see the midwives' faithful response. The text says that the midwives feared the Lord. The Old Testament does not ever use the word religion. 
In fact, there is no word in Hebrew, at least in the Old Testament period, that means religion. But frequently we find this phrase, fear of the Lord, and it conveys what we might call religion in English. And so it is said that the midwives feared the Lord, whereas Pharaoh was afraid of men. The midwives demonstrated their faith by refusing to obey the wicked command of the Pharaoh. But we find something interesting there in verse 18 in the response that they give to the Pharaoh when he asks them why they're allowing the boys to live. They say, well, you know, these, these Hebrew women, they're so vigorous. We can't get there in time. The children are already born and it's too late for us to do anything. And people have handled this explanation in different ways because it seems pretty unlikely that this is happening every time. One suggestion has been made that this really is what's happening because of the way that Pharaoh has commanded them to do this. There's no way that, that they can kill these children without being noticed. And so that's essentially what they're saying. They're not really lying. Other people say, well, the midwives lie in verse 18, but they're never commended for lying. They're only commended because they saved lives. And then some say, well, the Hebrew women, the midwives, Shifra and Pua, they lied. And it was okay because they were trying to save lives. Now, why does this matter? Why do we care whether or not the midwives lied and whether or not they're commended, they're blessed by God for lying? Well, a few things. First of all, we have to look at the nature of God and the nature of the devil. In John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus says that the devil is the father of lies. He is the original liar. And he says when the devil lies, he speaks his native language. He speaks from his character. By way of contrast, Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God is truth. His character is truth. When he speaks, he always speaks truth. And so it's very concerning to us to think about the possibility of God commending a liar. Yet this is not the only reason that we're concerned about this passage. We're also concerned because we expect God to be faithful, consistent, and just. And if he commands elsewhere that we tell the truth, that we not lie, in fact, one of the Ten Commandments says you shall not bear false witness, then it would seem inconsistent that he would bless these women for lying. And then finally, there's the very practical question. Is it ever okay for you and me to lie? Now, a few things that we ought to consider. First of all, it's not likely that you or I will be in a situation akin to the one that Shipra and Pua found themselves in. But if we are, we have to make a decision based on two things. We have to make a decision based upon the word of God, what he has revealed to us, and the character of Jesus Christ, in whom Isaiah says in chapter 53, no deceit was found in his mouth. Second of all, we have to make a decision that is within our conscience. The Apostle Paul tells us that as people of God, we must live within our conscience. Now, the Hebrew midwives saved lives. Andrea Bocelli, Steve Jobs, Tim Tebow, Justin Bieber. What do these men have in common? Well, they're all famous. They're all highly successful in their professional lives. And they were all almost aborted. Andrea Bocelli, Steve Jobs, Tim Tebow, Justin Bieber, John Smith, you, me, all life matters to God. Life is valuable to God, not because of the number of talents that we have, not because of the level of achievement to which we may attain, but because we are made in his image. In the words of one writer, Peter Heck, 
life is valuable because of what it is, not what it does. Whether that's making beautiful music or being tone deaf, inventing a light bulb and unlocking spectacular scientific mysteries or needing help tying our shoelaces. Life is valuable to God. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus addresses his disciples in the context of knowing that they will face persecution if they profess his name. Just as he was persecuted, so also they will be persecuted. And he tells them, beginning at verse 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Of course, as we talk now about the value of life, we're thinking about those little boys, those Hebrew boys that Shifra and Pua were commanded to kill. But we're also talking about Shifra and Pua, because I think sometimes when we look at these forgotten people in the Bible, they're forgotten because what they did, it doesn't seem that extravagant. But look at it again. By a simple act of faithfulness to God, Shifra and Pua are part of God's plan in preserving his nation. By simple acts of faithfulness, you and I participate in God's plans today. By simple acts of faithfulness, we show the image of God that is within us. Life is valuable to God, not because of the number of talents we have, not even because of our faithfulness to him, but when we're faithful to him, that's worth remembering. It's worth remembering Shifra and Pua, who were faithful to God. Finally, we see in verses 20 through 22, God's gracious regard. We see three things in this passage, uh, in these verses specifically. We see that God blessed the midwives, Shifra and Pua, and gave them families. The text literally says something like he gave them houses, but that means he gave most likely in the context that he gave them large families. We see that in spite of Pharaoh's efforts, the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, continues to grow in strength and to multiply in number. And finally, we see that Pharaoh's plans move into the open. Whereas before this was a secret plot that Pharaoh had to take the lives of the Hebrew boys, he makes a public declaration. Now, what that does is it reveals his intentions, but it also escalates the danger. Whereas Shifra and Pua were able to sort of work under the radar and save these lives, now if anyone sees a Hebrew boy under a certain age, they know that he is alive in violation of the Pharaoh's command. And so the danger is heightened in this situation by Pharaoh's public command. Now, I want to address each one of these briefly. First of all, the matter of the midwives. God blesses them after this act of faithfulness, and it raises the question, did the midwives earn God's favor? Did they earn God's favor? Did they receive this blessing as a reward for their faithfulness? Some would use a passage like this and others to suggest that faithfulness leads to living our dreams. One famous TV preacher whose name you would probably recognize says, this is what allows God to do great things. God is moved by our faith. But I would suggest that such an explanation is not only unfaithful to the whole message of Scripture, but it is too simple and self-serving. Second of all, God continues to bless the nation. The faithful action of the midwives certainly helps in this, but God was not dependent upon them. Third of all, this public decree of Pharaoh, which heightens the danger. You may ask, well, did the midwives actually serve God's purposes or not in their faithfulness? Because their actions lead to this heightened danger. And where is God? And all of this. 
But as the story will continue, we learn that because of this public decree, Moses ends up in the Pharaoh's household, which leads to the events of the Exodus. And what that tells us is God is at work for his plans, regardless of whether or not people are faithful to him. He will do what he has set out to do, what his plan is to do from the beginning, his plan to create this nation, to bless it and multiply it, and through it to bless all people. Psalm 34 and verse 8 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear the Lord have no lack. Verse 9. Can we earn God's favor? No. But when we're faithful to him, we begin to see better his goodness at work in the world. The obedient life is the best life, but not always in the way that we might expect, and often in spite of the hardships that we face. We do not earn our blessings, but when we live the faithful life, we are able to experience God's goodness more fully. Faithfulness is not about what we can accomplish, but about walking in step with our God and the plans that he has to accomplish in this world. Even when things seem their worst, God has a plan. And so we do remember people like Shifra and Pua because they feared the Lord. Matter of fact, this passage is really about two things. It's about fear and it's about faithfulness. Whom or what do you fear? Is your fear the fear of man that is so dangerous, according to the book of Psalms? Or is your fear a godly fear, a fear of God that leads to faithfulness? Faithfulness that does not earn God's favor, but is an expression of the respect and awe that you have of a good God who loves you. I'm going to ask uh, that we have a prayer as we close. And then the invitation will be yours. Let's bow together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather through this virtual medium. We know it's not the same as being together in person, and yet we're grateful for it. We thank you, Father, for loving us and blessing us. We thank you for giving us your word that challenges us, that forces us to think about difficult situations, that reminds us of where our values must lie and must align with yours. Please help us to fear you and not to allow fear, human fear, to rule in our lives. Help us to see faithfulness as an expression of that respect that we have for you. Help us to live faithfully to you in the little things and the big things, knowing that you are faithful to us. We thank you above all for Jesus who gave his life for us, and we pray for those who do not yet know him, who have not yet received your grace and benefited from your faithfulness and the plan that you set out from the beginning of time. Please help us to reach out and help those who do not yet know that goodness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Rock of ages, left for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from the risen side would flow be a sin the double cure cleanse me from its guilt and power not the labor of my hands can fulfill the law's demands. Could my zeal no rest it no? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone.
song before we partake of the Lord's Supper is page 349 in the old book, 621 in the new book. You may get drunk. 349 in the old book. 10,000 angels, verses 1 and 4. Verses yeah, wow. 1 and 4. Yeah. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They sat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him, he to blame. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. To the howling mob he yielded, he did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried it finished, he gave himself to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and As we prepare this morning to partake of the communion, I've selected uh, Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 7, to help us remember the great cost that faced Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearing is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Please bow with me, and we'll have a word of prayer for the loaf. Our Father, which art in heaven, we're thankful, God, for this day, and we're thankful most of all for the greatest gift of all, salvation through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We realize, Father, this come at a great cost, great pain, suffering. Help us, Lord, to live a life of service, much like Christ, out of a heart of love, one that's committed, committed to your cause and submissive to your will. Help us, Lord, as we partake of this loaf now. Help us to partake of it, which is his broken body. Help us to partake of it in a way that would uh, suit you and bless you and glorify you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
pray once more. Our Lord in heaven, we're thankful for the opportunity it is to approach your throne in prayer. We're thankful, Father, for the chance it is to understand that we as sinners have been forgiven, that the blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus, has uh, shed it on our behalf. We ask, Father, that as we partake of this emblem, that we do so in a manner that's pleasing in your sight, understanding the responsibility and the grace it is to be a part of your family. These things are asked in Jesus' name. Amen. I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they is precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. Counselor, Prince of Peace, mighty God is he. Saving me, keeping me from my sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer. Praise, praise his name. Once again, we want to thank you all for participating in this service. Uh, we'll be praying this week that we'll have better weather next weekend, but should the weather turn out bad, then the elders will again send out uh, notice uh, for a virtual meeting if that's necessary, but uh, hopefully it will not be so. Um, are there any announcements that need to be made that I may have missed? Uh, Frank, there's uh, some birthdays this week. Yes, that's true. Uh, uh, Kathy, go Kathy, ahead. Thorpe, Kathy Thorpe on the, uh, the 16th, uh, Alan Oglesby the 18th, and Linda Bonner, the 19th. Okay, thank you, Wilbur. Yes, sir. Appreciate that. Yes. Uh, if there are no other announcements that need to be made, we need to pray together in a closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to praise you and thank you so much for this good day. We want to thank you for our health, for the love that you show us, for the opportunity to study your word, for the good lesson that was presented this morning, for the opportunity to worship together virtually. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would continue to bless us now as we separate, that you would encourage us, help us to study your word, to put it into practice in our lives, to touch positively the lives of those around us, to bless them. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would grant us courage and wisdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.